Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for our latest episode of IODD Talks. I am your co-host Nathan Turner, and today we are delighted to have joining us Jennifer Caro, who's going to share her exciting story of personal advocacy and her fight for community living. But before we get started, I want to take and I'll take this chance to welcome my good friend Marcy Strotter as co-host to the Ohio DD Talks podcast. Marcy, do you just want to tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Hi, my name is Marcy Strotter. I am a self-advocate. I work at my provider agency, Ohio at Home. I'm a self-advocate consultant, and I'm also an Ohio Tech ambassador and a Project Star State trainer. And I'm on the Franklin County Board of DD. Thank you so much, Marcy. I'm delighted to have you because I think, you know, the strength of our unique perspectives is really going to continue to elevate the work of DD Council and you being a past member of DD Council and all of my experiences with leadership. I think we're going to do a great job together elevating the voices of people living with disabilities, and I'm so excited. Again, everyone, thank you so much for joining us, and I want to get the show started by giving Jennifer a chance to introduce herself, talk about her life experiences and her fight for community living, and just offer some insight based on that experience. Thank you, Nate. Um, And hi, Marcy. Um, It's so awesome to be here with you guys. You do a wonderful job. Watch some past episodes and I always like what you guys, um, Nate, what you have to say when you're interviewing people and look forward to um, seeing what Marcy uh, is going to contribute to this as time goes on. So thank you both for having me here. Definitely. Thank Um, you. We're looking forward to hearing more of your story. Great. Um, I was actually born with a form of muscular dystrophy called spinal muscular atrophy. And I was the first of four children. And actually none of my um, sisters or brother have a disability. Um, And I, since I was old enough to talk, I have been a self-advocate. I guess I'm one of those stubborn people that um, always make my voice um, loud and clear so people know what my needs are. I've also always had caregivers. Obviously my parents were my first caregiver and I'll talk more about that journey. But um, I even decided really like at a really young age, they, I was born before the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed into law. So I know life before the ADA and life after the ADA. And I could tell you that it's life for people with disabilities after the signing of the ADA is much, much better, much better. Um, I, way back when I was young, I think, I don't even remember how young I was, but they were talking because I had really bad uh, spinal curvature called scoliosis. And I remember my parents leaving that decision up to me and I had talked to the doctors and they were telling me all that was gonna go wrong with me and my body if I did not have the surgery done. And I told them to stop talking because I knew that I was not gonna get it done but I didn't want any of their bad health ideas even in my brain. So I was the one that decided um, at such a young age. And ever since that point, I have been advocating for my needs um, ever since. Um, In school, schooling was a lot different than it is now. I did have an IEP back when I went to school, but it was a thing called mainstreaming that if I wanted to be in classes with my non-disabled peers, that I had to prove myself mentally and physically. And then they did what was called mainstreaming and I was able to get into classes um, with my non-disabled peers, but we were mostly segregated back then. It was a a classroom um, that had multi-disability kids in it. And then they were completely separate from their non-disabled peers. And I am so glad that things have changed in the educational world and it's not as fierce, I guess, anymore. Um, 
And so I'm glad that things have changed in that realm because that was horrible to be singled out and called out. And all I wanted to do as a kid was be with my, you know, just kids my own age. And so what that I use a wheelchair, who cares? It doesn't matter. I wanted to be, you know, among everybody else. So I'm glad to see that things in the educational world are changing. Um, Thank you so much for sharing that. I, you know, when I think about my experiences being a part of the ADA generation, I got to benefit from all of the advocacy that your generation did to make sure that we had equal access to all of the rights that everybody else enjoys. And I really think access to integrated education is one of the most important things that happened to me. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, what did you learn from all of that advocacy that you had to do? And how did those experiences strengthen your advocacy skills? I remember one story in particular that um, it was in seventh grade and my peers were in algebra class and they put me in a classroom with three other people with disabilities. And it was just a general math class when the rest of my peers were in algebra. And um, I was so angry because I wanted to be in algebra class and the teacher was like, well, we'll see what you do after this year, we'll consider it. Well, I literally took the math book home that weekend, did all the problems in the math book and slapped them back on her desk the next day. And she was like, oh, okay. Um, yeah, we'll move you into algebra class. So, you know, it was things like that, that you had to fight loud. And, you know, if you could get your parents behind you, um, to do a lot of that advocacy work. But other than that, you were pretty much pigeonholed and you know stuck wherever they thought that you needed to be. And the amount of testing that went on, like every year I had to go through days and days of testing, you know, both the mental and the physical. And that was every year, every year until I got into, I think it was, it stopped around 10th or 11th grade. And it was days of testing. They had psychologists talk to you. The teachers talked to you. They had to get your, um, the caregivers came to school and they had to learn about your needs. And, but most of the time you were in the classroom with other people that were disabled and you were hardly ever let out of that room unless you put up a stink. And yeah, it was, it was a bad situation. It truly was. But, so you're saying, or at least what I'm hearing is that you weren't given yeah, you know, the presumption of competence or, you know, that every other student has where, you know, you're expected to have learned from your experiences. Exactly. It was a lot of ableist views, if I can throw that word into the mix. But yeah, for sure. And it wasn't like, you know, my disability wasn't one that was going to change overnight either. So you would think that my competency would, you know, that you wouldn't have to go through that year after year after year. But that's not what they believed in at the time. And along those lines, what are some other techniques that you use to um, be able to communicate more effectively and solve problems like these as they came up to make sure that your rights were respected? I know that my mom was a big advocate for me at the time. Um, she, I know that like, even like during restaurants, we would go to restaurants and the, the waiter or waitress would talk to my mom instead of me. And they're like, well, where does the wheelchair want to sit? And my mom was like, no, there's a person sitting in the wheelchair. Ask her where she wants to sit. So, you know, my mom always would speak up if I didn't jump in there. But it is really like I've always been an educator at heart. So I don't necessarily get mad at people when they presume things but I always want to educate them and sort of correct their thinking because, you know, we all have biases. We all have, you know, pre preconceived notions. So, you know, I feel like, all right, well, just give me a chance, ask me, and I'll tell you that it's not that way or that your thinking might be a little bit skewed, but, you know, we had a lot of meetings with teachers and administrators. And the thing is not to give up it's very easy to get frustrated and say, heck with it, but you don't wanna do that. You wanna keep, just find ways to 
keep talking to people because eventually you'll reach that those people that will go to bat for you and will believe in you. And the thing is not to give up. Absolutely. I agree with you 100% that persistence is critical and just that not giving up for people living with disabilities to have the life they want. And I'm wondering if you might want to reflect a little bit more on, you know, your fight for community living or share any other advice you might have based on your experiences and what you've learned. Yeah, but like I mentioned at the beginning, I lived with my mom and dad. And then um, I was in my 30s and I had just gotten my first adapted van that I could drive. So it was literally, I was 30, but I was acting like a teenager because I never really got the freedoms that all teenagers get, you know, when they turn 16 and they can drive. So my teenage years actually happened to me in my 30s. So I was staying out late because I was driving and I was doing things, you know, that like everybody gets to do. Um, so, and of course my mom was getting mad that I was getting home late, even though I was in my thirties. So I eventually ended up leaving my family home and going to move in with a male caregiver slash friend of mine, um, because I was still frightened to take the journey into independent living. So it took me another 14 years. I stayed with um, him until I my health started to get worse and he was really no longer able to take care of me. So I did for a time live in a nursing home. I, for two years, um, I ended up living in a nursing home, one to get my health back up to, to, to be better than I was. Cause, um, and then another year to get over my fear of taking a chance on independent living. I mean, independent living, living by yourself in your own place is difficult for anybody, you know, disability, no disability. It's scary for a lot of people. There are some people, even with no disability, that don't want to live by themselves. So, you know, and I like my alone time. I like being by myself. And I finally, because the nursing home was just, it was awful. It was absolutely awful. And I mean, I know they're necessary evils, but I don't ever want to go back to a place like that again. And so I was like, yeah, okay, I have to get out of this place. I don't want to move in with anybody. I'm going to take the shot. And I actually used the program, um, the federal program called Money Follows the Person, which is called Home Choice in Ohio. And it gives you federal money to help you to move out of a nursing home. So they pay for things like your first month's rent, security deposit, um, it helps buy furniture and things you need for the place to live. So I used that opportunity and moved into the place I live now. I have lived here for seven years now. I am the happiest I have ever been and so glad that I took that chance to get here. I'm so happy for you. I love it when people are able to take risks and, and embrace their own decisions and learn from their experiences to have a better outcome. And I know, you know, as, as part of that transition, you were recently appointed to DD Council. And I want to turn it over to Marcy because she also used to serve on DD Council to ask a few questions about your experiences there. Okay. What is your role on DD Council? DD Council is so much fun. So what's your role? Yeah, Marcy, I've heard that you were actually on it back in the day. Is that right? Yes. That's awesome. In uh, October this past year, um, I was appointed by the governor. And um, actually, when I turned 50, which is three years ago, I decided that I was going to work on um, systems advocacy, disability advocacy as a full-time job, even though most of the things I do, I don't get paid for, but it's okay because it's worth it to me to leave my mark on the world to try to make it better for other people that are younger, that are coming up behind me. So um, I have a, there's a lot of things I'm actually doing and DD Council is one of them. And I, I, all my life, I've always wanted to be on DD Council, but it really never worked out as far as timing goes. So I took a chance and I applied and then I got the call one day 
I was so excited. They sent me this official looking plaque with the seal signed by the governor. It's really pretty. I have it in a frame on the wall. Um, and it was super exciting. So I've been to one council meeting so far. I am on the, um, the their policy committee. So I'm excited to do more work in that arena to talk to uh, legislators about changing things so that people with disabilities can lead better lives. Um, so that is definitely one area I know I'm gonna be more active in. So it was super excited. We have another meeting coming up in February. So I know that as time goes on, I will be more and more active um, you know, on the council. I'm so happy and proud for you, Jennifer. Thank you. I also, Nate, if it's okay to mention, yeah. Um, when I moved into my own apartment, I just wanted to go back a little bit, if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, I my my whole family was not for me moving into my own place. Many of them had really mixed feelings, and um, so I can say that not all people with disabilities have good support groups around them. Um, sometimes parents can mean well, but I am a firm believer in that everybody has the right to fail and that everybody, I mean, you know, without disabilities, people without disabilities are making bad decisions all the time. So why shouldn't we, even though we have a disability, so what? We still have the right to fail. So, you know, a lot of times we learn from our mistakes that we make. And so even though my support group, my family members were against it, I still know what I wanted to do. And I stuck true to what my heart and my mind was telling me to do. And that is living on my own. And it really was the best decision that I ever made. So I just wanted to say that, you know, if you are an ally for people with disabilities, allow them to fail. I mean, obviously nothing that's gonna harm them, but be open to suggestions. Nate, is it okay if I ask Jennifer another question? Oh, absolutely. Um, when I was on council, I liked working with the staff and the other self-advocates on there and the other people that were parents and other people in the disability industry. How how are you liking all the combo, all of it coming together and working with everybody as a team? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's awesome. I think that more agencies need to get out of their so-called silos and kind of collaborate with other agencies. And I think that's one of the things that I'm gonna to try to work on um, in the council is to be open for more ideas, like even outside of their realm so that they get more people working, you know, across agencies and cooperative, collaborative work. I think that's great because everybody can help one another. I mean, we are all in this together, so why not help each other? We're getting toward the end of our time, but I did want to ask you one last, what I think is a really important question. Why is it important for people living with disabilities to have representation on community organizations like the D Council? It is so important. Um, any organization that you are interested in or that has a similar outlook, you should try to get it involved with. Um, I am a big proponent of that phrase, nothing about us without us. So there any organization, any company that makes decisions about the lives of people with disabilities, you don't know unless you've been there, unless you've lived it. So those organizations, companies need to have representation of people with all kinds of disabilities. Um, they're making the decisions. It's not just, it, it, it is about people with lived experience. How else are they gonna know? They're not gonna make the right decisions unless we are involved alongside of them, helping them to create those answers, decisions, and help them make those. So it is so important for people to um, speak up and 
just keep asking until they can't say no to you. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us. As we conclude, did you have any final remarks or anything that you didn't address that you want to address before we wrap up the show? No, I would just say that just the main thing is not to give up. Keep fighting for what you believe in, even if others are trying to talk you out of it. Um, and go and live your dreams, your best life. Absolutely. I couldn't think of a better note to end our time together. And I want to thank you, Jennifer, and I want to thank our listeners for joining us today. Please remember to share your stories with us at IODD Talks on our social media, and we look forward to seeing you next one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.